Hello, um, I'm Betsy Warland, and I'm really glad to be meeting you today and or this evening. I'm not sure when this will be viewed. Um, and I'm going to be reading a little bit from my book uh, just to give you a feel for it. I want to mention that it was part of a new series, a signature series, which is a, for the press to occasionally reissue a feminist classic. Uh, my book, Bloodroot, initially came out in um, 2000. So let me just tell you a, a little bit about why I'm chosen to read what I'm reading today. Um, what this book was a lot about was my, my narrative position and my mother's narrative position. And they went like this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some of you have run into that yourself with your mom. Um, and what I was investigating in the book is what are the were the backstories more about that, some of which I've even found out about since it first came out in 2000. Um, this book taught me more about writing than any other book. Uh, this, the second edition is now, I think, my 14th book. Um, there is a foreword by Susan Olding, uh, which is really evocative, uh, both of mind and uh, heart. And then I wrote an essay at the end, reflecting back 20 years later um, about the book and what's happened since that time. Um, interestingly enough, I think this book is probably more relevant today than it was even in 2000. So here we go. You'll, you'll, you make your own decision. Uh, I'm starting at uh, near the beginning of the book and I'm going to be, uh, you can see my little, <laughs> I'm gonna be jumping around a little bit just to give you a feel for it. As I write about my mother, I untell her. She is dead, ever absent. Her daughter, as her daughter, my knowledge of her as a person is inevitably and necessarily limited. Throughout the years we lived in relation to one another, we were most comfortable in ourselves when absent from one another. We were each other's blank space. My mother's tolerance of me was enabled by a silent pact that I tell her very little about my life. This narrative traces the blank spaces of what we could not say, what will never be known, of what will never be fulfilled. In other words, this narrative is about abandoning disappointment, acquiescing to grace. Our mother had an imaginative relationship to truth. She didn't out and out lie. She rearranged the story's parts like someone moving furniture in a motel room. It was presentation. How it looked to her was how it would look to others. This is the basis of how it then was made true. Truth cut in half reveals itself. As her daughter, I hated the liberties she took. With her cut and paste editing, she had little regard for others' feelings or sense of integrity. I couldn't, however, think of her as a liar. I still can't. I thought of her as afraid. Then much later, I grew to think of her as a remarkable metaphorist. Over the years when reading from or referring to Bloodroot in public, I have acknowledged with increasing conviction that my mother gave me this book. In one respect, this seems nonsensical. She was dead. She would have never chosen to reveal some of the stories I have in the book and likely would have been horrified that I have told them. It's possible that mom may also have felt relief and my deepest hope, respect. Yet the experience of what Bloodroot taught me about writing and shifting storylines that had alienated me as a daughter sheds light on the intensity of why so many Bloodroot readers have loved this book. Mom's face after surgery, how it emerged from the bottomless, mouth drawn, hair pressed back, 
eyes black holes of underworld vision, looking at the living with no nostalgia. The impossibility of sustenance. The mouth knows it is merely a conduit. The truth? I am a gasping mouth. One day while in hospital, mom held up her hand, her index and middle finger tightly crossed. I'm so grateful you're here. We're so close. We're just like one. Yes, we are. And we sat quiet with this hard found tenderness, so late to come, so remarkably vast. Then mom astonished me. You made that happen, didn't you? I recovered by making a joke. It takes two. She smiled, her crooked smile. Yes, but you made it happen. Now I see what so few mothers seem to see, not the masks of distrusting superficiality, nor the masks of judgmental self-protectiveness. No, not these shields of hurt. Now I see the faces of distraught love, faces of daughters who lost their mothers. Though these were the very women who raised them, these faces were my face, no longer my face.